Good afternoon, everybody. We're calling on Brother Andy Walden to speak on the topic 2023, a year in review. Brother Andy. Okay, thanks, uh, Doug. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, being online this afternoon. It's lovely to see so many of you. Um, yeah, things are, are moving quickly, aren't they, as we're watching events that are happening around the world. And I'm sure all of us are on the edge of our seats looking at uh, these events that we've sort of long looked for, uh, that are sort of coming to pass uh, before our eyes. And perhaps events seem to move quickly. And then to some extent, sometimes events seem to move slowly. We sort of expect everything to suddenly happen very, very quickly. And almost uh, the verses should sort of cascade you know, hour by hour, and it's all over and done with very fast. And we know that doesn't tend to happen, that things take time to to come to fruition. But it certainly seems to be coming at a rate of knots uh, right now. And uh, that's what we're going to have a look at. We're going to look back at 2023 to sort of see how things develop during the year to reach the point that, that we're at now. And then we'll have a little think about you know, what sort of comes next down the track as best as we can see with Bible in hand. So I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. So you can give me a second because I've got to do a bit of um, uh, messing around just to move things around to get my uh, slides to uh, come up properly. So bear with me. Uh, I need to click on that. And then I need to click on that. It's going to look a bit odd just for a minute uh use oh hold on a minute go backwards uh, use present a view and then if i move that around move that to there okay right so doug does that look all right to you excellent okay so here we go looking at uh, 2023. And I guess on the screen at the minute are the key people that we want to consider in terms of the leaders of Israel, the leaders of Iran, and the leaders of Russia. And they're sort of the big three players that we're going to have, have a look at. Um, just before we get on and look at 2023, I was just going to show you uh, a couple of things, because obviously everything's building up. And the Bible talks a lot about the fact that in these last days, it's very much like a woman that is uh, in travail, as the authorized version says, or a, a woman that is pregnant and in labor about to give birth. And there's actually, when you look at it, it's quite an interesting study to see all the times that God talks about the world being in labor like a woman about to give birth at the time of the end. And of course, when you think about a woman, um, a mother to be, who's about to give birth to a child, the contractions are beginning and the contractions are dilating the cervix. That's what that's all about. And when the cervix is fully dilated, there's a hormone released into the woman that causes this tremendous uh, urge to push. So there's contractions, the contractions start and they get closer together they get more severe, but the push is something different. The push comes at the very end when the cervix is, the cervix is fully dilated and there's nothing she can do about it. She's got to push. Where I think we are in the sort of scheme of a, of a, a, a woman in labor is near the very end of the contractions. But the push I don't think has quite started. The push is when the screaming starts. You know, that's when it's it's sort of the extreme pain, which doesn't last very long, but it's that final amount of pain that comes at the end. And I think the push that comes at the end is what uh, Daniel calls and Jesus calls the time of trouble such as never was. And even though we're in a time at the minute which is fast approaching the time of trouble such as never was, I don't think we're in the time of trouble this second that is that is a time of trouble such as never was, because there's been times worse than we're in right now uh, in, in history. But 
we're fast approaching it. And when you think about the contractions that have come over the last number of years, from our point of view, there's been, in the UK, there's been Brexit. That was a, and really this impacted not just the UK, it had a big impact um, on uh, especially the EU and the way that's now headed. Um, that was ripping out a country that was embedded and entangled in the EU and the UK coming out actually, of course, was uh, a sign long looked for um, or, you know, back in the days of John Thomas. I mean, it's amazing how we saw uh, in Elpis Israel, he spoke about uh, Britain not being part of um, mainland uh, Europe. Then we lurched from that into COVID and then we've, uh, we, you know, a global pandemic that shut everything down. Then we pretty much on the day that COVID was declared to be sort of, but you know, life getting back to normal and we can move into a post-COVID world. Russia uh, decided to, in 2022, launch a uh, horrific war against Ukraine, which had huge consequences and destabilised um, not only Europe. I mean, it's the worst war in Europe since the Second World War, but we, you know, it was, it was, you know, horrendous scenes on our TV. And of course, even though it's not on our TV screens quite as much now, it's still there. And the war is still raging day by day by day with hundreds of thousands of people involved. And it looks like World War I scenarios where you've got people in trenches. It's horrendous. And of course, that has had a very destabilizing geopolitical impact on not only Europe but around the world because it's what I didn't realize I don't know if you did but Ukraine is a breadbasket of many many countries it's the breadbasket of Europe it supplied and still tries to supply uh, crops and wheat and so on to very poor countries like Egypt and Lebanon and so on and because the prices have now rocketed up because of this war that's destabilizing those countries as well. And before that war is even over, we lurched into Israel being at war. And now there's two major wars going on. And the Israeli war also is now spiraling. So when a contraction comes, they don't stop. Some people have said to me, oh, well, maybe all this could die down and it could be 50 years away. And I don't think that's the case. I don't know what you think, but it's rare for a woman to come into hospital in the later stages of contractions to then be told to go home. And, you know, it's 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 probably not going to happen. It it feels like it's definitely underway. And all I think we're going to see are the contractions get closer together and more severe, leading to the push. Jesus said, of course, in John 16, verse 21, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take your joy away. So Jesus is comparing his return and us seeing him and finally being gathered to be with him exactly like a woman giving birth. And now is the time of grief, but ultimately it's going to turn to joy for those who are looking uh, for him. So I thought I'd show you this. This was in our, uh, this is in the independent newspaper. This is a bit of a World Watch slide that went out a, a day or so ago, yesterday, in fact. And it's the it's the independent newspaper dated January the 19th. Are we witnessing the opening salvos of World War Three was the headline in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And it said in its first paragraph, it's hard to escape the impression of a theatre of military conflict that is in inexorably growing to the east and the south, if not yet to the north and the west. And if you look backwards rather than forwards, the Hamas massacres of Israel is on the 7th of October and Israel's all out military response can be seen as a turning as turning the tiny sliver of the Gaza Strip 
into the epicenter of a conflict that could embrace regions many hundreds of miles further afield. And David Cameron, I don't know if you've heard of David Cameron, but he was a UK prime minister some time ago. He's now come back in as the UK's uh, foreign minister. It's highly unusual for an ex-prime minister to come back into any other role, and he has done, um, at the very point in time that the world is at this sort of crisis. And he said this week, it's in the blue down the bottom, these are his words, it is hard to think of a time when there has been so much danger and insecurity and instability in the world. The lights are absolutely flashing red on the global dashboard right and that's where we are and this i don't believe is going to get cured by man now it's almost like we've got a hole in the side of titanic and if the if the world is the titanic there's a bit of a gash in the side and slowly but surely and inevitably this world is going to sink into the what the bible calls armageddon and i think that process is uh, the process has started so this tiny little gash in the side which is the hamas actions and terrorist actions on the 7th of october have put in motion um the a vortex that's sucking gradually and slowly but surely all nations into conflict over Israel and yeah there might be some pauses and and things as we go through but ultimately I think we're on track now um that will lead to the return of Jesus and of course that's what we're looking for we're not looking at all these things because we delight in war and conflict and death and destruction we're looking at it because God has said please please I'm giving you signs and I'm giving you them so that you stay awake and alert and are ready. And ultimately, brothers and sisters and friends, I guess it's to keep our lives in perspective. Don't you? I mean, I, I, if if there was a, if God is giving us these signs, why is he doing it? Why has he told us about it? I think it is so that we are absolutely ready, uh, as ready as can be uh, to see Jesus when, when he comes back. So I'm going to run through a few slides from last year just to show you that October the 7th, when Hamas invaded Israel, should not have been any surprise to us if we're looking at these things on a regular basis through Miles and what he's doing on the Daily World Watch, through what I'm trying to do on the Weekly World Watch and what Brother Don Pierce does with milestones and many, 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 many others that, are, that, you know, and all of us are looking at these things. It's not just a few, but all of us are looking at these things. So I'm going all the way back uh, to the back end of 2022. So this is just about just over a year ago, a year and a couple of weeks ago. And there was this big news that Benjamin, Net Benjamin Netanyahu had come back into power in Israel, and the press were saying, you know, he's now head of the most hardline government in the country's history, which threatens new confrontations with the Palestinians. So 2023 kicked off with those sort of um, headlines. And, and by the way, for those of you who don't get the world watch, and I'm sure not everybody does, but I find a headline from the newspaper, which is what I've put in the orange block at the top, that's the date from the newspaper or the uh, news article online. And anything in black is word for word taken from wherever I've sourced it. And I'm, I'm not going to conspiracy websites. I, I have to find it in at least three places for it to end up in the World Watch as a, as a rule of thumb for me to say, yeah, this is, this is coming from different directions, just to make sure that you know, I'm putting in things that are, are real and and are and are happening. Anything in blue is my my comment down the bottom, and obviously, you know, you you've got to read that and either accept uh, my take on it or or not. Um, we moved into March last year, and of course, Israel was in a lot of division uh, last year, especially in the first half of the year, uh, because Netanyahu started to try and push through different policies within Israel that was sort of changing the legal situation. 
and it caused enormous protests in, in Israel, the like of which haven't been seen since it was really set up as a nation in 1948. And uh, it says there several factors are fueling the potential for an explosion. Um, uh, the first line, preoccupied by judicial restructuring, Israel's policymakers have little bandwidth to deal with the external crises that threaten to create a perfect storm. Uh, in April last year, Middle East expert says Iran's planning a multi-front attack on Israel. And down the bottom in bold, you can see it says Iran is planning to launch a combined attack on Israel in the foreseeable future that will include all the forces at its disposal in the Arab countries. In May, Iran assembles allies for rocket attacks on Israel. Um, he, it says Iran is for, trying to forge a defense pact, drawing together militant organizations across the Middle East to coordinate rocket launches against Israel. And the likes of Hezbollah and Hamas and Islamic Jihad are all mentioned uh, there. They're looking to create, it says, a multi-front war against Israel. Israel uh, had its birthday on May the 4th uh, last year, it, it was 75. And again, on its birthday, lots of articles about the dangerous situation that was confronting Israel. Iran and armed Hezbollah and Hamas groups have joined forces now to build a new coalition against uh, Israel. And also, uh, well, we'll move on to the also in just in just a minute. Um, the other thing that was uh, happening at the same time that we were seeing these headlines about what Iran was doing, Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, moved into high gear to create some sort of peace agreement with Israel, pushed along by America and Joe Biden, who wanted to see and still do want to see Saudi Arabia on side uh, with Israel. So Saudi Arabia wants thriving thriving Israel after years of fractured Middle East, which was the headline in June. Uh, in July, Iran is ready to help Palestinians win by force over Israel. Um, in Again in July, middle of July, Abbas, that's Mahmoud Abbas, he, of course, is the leader of the Palestinian Authority, uh, who control, to some extent, the West Bank. He vowed to liberate all of Palestine, including Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem is sort of on there, on the Palestinian agenda. That's what this is really all about, as we'll see in a minute. Hezbollah gears up for showdown with Israel in a, in a series of strategic, political and military moves, Hezbollah is intensifying preparations for an imminent confrontation with Israel. Islamic Jihad, another terrorist group based mainly in Gaza, we must use the crisis in Israel for war against it. So they're seeing the turmoil that was happening in Israel and the people on the streets and all this internal wrangling is the opportune time to unite in a war against Israel. Uh, as you can see there, it says it's an historic opportunity, they say, which it must utilize for fighting and the conflict for the sake of the Palestinian problem. Uh, then we have this in September, Netanyahu tells the UN that Israel is at the cusp of making an historic agreement with Saudi Arabia. And um, it says down the bottom there that uh, I, this is Netanyahu talking, I believe that we're at the cusp of an even more dramatic breakthrough, an historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Netanyahu said peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia will truly create a new Middle East. Then... We arrive at this October the 7th, 2023, a date that will forever be written into the hearts and minds of the nation of Israel as the worst loss of Jewish life on one single day since the Holocaust. That is how terrible the event was on October the 7th, 
around about 1,200 Israelis uh, murdered in horrific, horrendous ways that we're not going to talk about now. But it, it, it is shocking beyond belief if you've read any sort of the detail of what Hamas actually did. I think, actually, Hamas and what they did even shocked the leaders of Hamas who sent in these uh, ravenous wolves into uh, Israel. I think, from what I've read, they thought Israel would fight back and would stop stop it fairly quickly, but they were almost left to roam free, causing havoc for a whole day. And their violence and uh you know horrific behavior uh was 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 left untapered for such a long period of time it was horrendous and so horrendous was it that israel as a country with all its divisions almost overnight instantly united behind a war cabinet and the war cabinet's sole aim is to destroy hamas and that is highly, highly, highly significant. And despite pressure at the minute, they're saying we're going to uh, continue on this path of removing Hamas from existence. Um, what it did almost straight away, I think uh, the West, especially America in the UK, had the horrible feeling that this could spiral very quickly out of control. And so... Um, warships, uh, surveillance craft, um, you know, the major, the, the, you know, the major fleets of American Britain were sent into the Mediterranean, aircraft carriers and the like, to sort of show a massive amount of um, support, not only for Israel, but also to say to Israel's enemies, look, we're going to back Israel um, on, if, if, you know, if you were to also join in. Um, Netanyahu said, we, we vow to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth, and that objective has not gone away. Um, Hamas and Hezbollah met together in October to discuss how they were going to achieve real victory for uh, the Palestinians. Lebanon, on the verge of war with Israel, as Hezbollah warns, a billion Arabs are ready to support Gaza. That was in November. In December, Israel's multi-front conflict threatens regional escalation. Israel's grinding war on Gaza has become a multi-front conflict as relatively low-intensity face-offs with Iranian-aligned forces in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq and Yemen all threaten to ignite a regional conflagration. And, and also what's interesting in this one is that Israel, and they, they're saying this now, of course, that Hamas isn't the end of the story. We can't have a terrorist organization on our northern border because they'll end up doing exactly what Hamas has done on our southern border. So something's going to have to change with Hezbollah in the north and they have got to withdraw. And of course, Hezbollah is saying, well, we're not going to withdraw. So this is still very much on the cards of Hezbollah being more and more drawn into it. And all of this, and I think in, you know, in your country, in our country, in many, many countries around the world, anti-Semitism has rocketed up. I presume you've seen this. I'm sure I've seen uh, articles from Canadian-based press saying, like we've seen, 1,000% increase in anti-Semitic uh, events. So, look, though, all of that... Uh, just some of the slides that I put out last year on the Weekly World Watch. So, you know, you could see what, what was coming down the track. Yeah, you don't know the day, you don't know the hour, and you certainly don't, don't know exactly how it's going to materialise. But when it happened on October the 7th, it was, well, yeah, you could see it happening. You could see something was building up. Now, of course, we've looked at this before. So Psalm 83 you know, from my perspective, and I know we all have different views on things, but when I read Psalm 83, I'm looking at it in a latter day context. Uh, Asaph, who wrote it, we're told back in Chronicles, is a seer, who that means he's a prophet. He is prophesying. 
And this particular psalm, Psalm 83, talks all about, I've got my Bible in front of me as well, but it's talking here in Psalm 83 about a confederacy of people that come together to destroy Israel. Some say to me, well, yeah, but maybe this is ancient. Maybe this was fulfilled in 67 or 40, 48 or 1973. Why do you think it's still to be fulfilled? And the reason, there's two reasons why I think Psalm 83 uh, is to be fulfilled uh, and still to be fulfilled. Uh, one is that the, the psalm actually concludes, if, you, if you've got your Bible in front of you, in Psalm 83, the last verse says that all, that all these things happen in the psalm, that men may know that thou whose name is Jehovah, it says in the authorised version, or Yahweh, art the most high over all the earth. And I don't think we are in a position even as yet, of course, that all men recognise Yahweh, God, the true God, is God over all the earth. But that's the conclusion of Psalm 83. That's what it's leading up to. The other thing is that the alliance that comes against Israel, which we'll look at in a second, all are completely destroyed. So just the very fact that we're even talking about and looking at a, confeder a confederacy that still wants to annihilate Israel, by definition means this psalm cannot have been fulfilled because they're still in existence. And as we'll see in a minute, they have to come to an end. So look, the enemies growl, they conspire against your people, they plot, they say, let's destroy Israel as a nation, so their name is no more remembered. That's exactly what Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Hamas, the Palestinians, Iran, all of them are saying this. And there's a list of people who are saying it. The tents of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, Hagrites, uh, Biblios, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, the people of Tyre, even Assyria has joined with them. And you can do this as well as I've done it. You can go and look on a map. And if you find that these people are in very different places to what's on the screen, then drop me an email and say, hey, Andy, you know, Moab isn't there. It's actually in South America. You got it all wrong. Let me know. But as far as I can see, this is where those people in Psalm 83 are. And every last one of them surrounds Israel. They're Israel's surrounding nearby enemies. Tyre, for instance, here, and Gebel, both in Lebanon. And Tyre in the south is stronghold of Hezbollah. And they've also got other bases in the north in, in, in the exact territory of Gebel. So these two tick off as Hezbollah, who, by the way, say we want to finish Israel off. Philistia is exactly the territory of the Gaza Strip. Uh, where the Palestinians live, and even the word Philistia is directly related to uh, Palestinian, and so Philistines and the Palestinians, even the name is rooted exactly uh, the same. If you want to look that up, you'll find that in many places to confirm that. The three that, so there's a couple that here that sort of a, might, you might put question marks over, Ammon, Moab, and Edom, uh, all were in the current territory of Jordan, which is sort of pro-West, and you might consider to be very much on side with Israel. We'll have a quick look at Jordan in just a second. The other one, it says in on the slide that I showed you, it says that um, Assyria is joined with them, and in the AV it says Asher, but Asher is the same as Assyria. All of these others, Gebel, Tyre, Philistia, Amalek, and all these, the, all of this little lot are tribes. The only one that are, isn't a tribe is uh, Assyria. That's why it's last on the list and it's singled out as being a nation. Now, let me just um, show you a couple of things then. I'm just going to cover off two things. One about Jordan and also about Assyria and where Assyria actually is, because does Assyria mean Syria, which is sort of where I've got it placed there? So let me just cover off these couple of things. So this is January the 16th, so what, just a few days ago in Israel news, Jordan moves military closer to the border with Israel. 
In an ominous sign of an expanding regional war, Jordan has been seen moving its army closer to the border with Israel. Israeli towns along the Jordanian border have reported gunfire towards their communities from the Jordanian soldiers. With the Hamas war raging and the potential for Israel's north becoming engulfed with a war with Hezbollah, most have assumed that the Jordanian border would be trusted to remain silent. This has not been the case. And a little bit further down, you notice, it says, in addition to the, the queen of uh, Jordan being a Palestinian, the Jordanian street itself, in other words, the population of Jordan, 80% of it is Palestinian. I mean, how amazing is that? Jordania, Jordan itself is Palestinian. In fact, they've got the largest amount of um, uh, Palestinian refugees in Jordan, numbering about 2.2 million of them, which is why it talks about the tents of Edom, the tabernacles of Edom, and there's 2.2 million Palestinians living in tents effectively in Jordan that were displaced back in 1948. So there's every, well, God says that they're going to be involved. And even though some have said to me, well, I don't know if Jordan will, I'm pretty certain they're going to get sucked into this at some point down the line. The other one was um, uh, Asher or Assyria that's joining with them, right? Now, I'm sure everybody would agree with me that it's not beyond the realms of um, possibility that Syria would join forces with Hezbollah and the Palestinians at some point down the line if this war keeps getting worse and worse. Because, one, Syria is technically at war with Israel, right? That's the first thing. And secondly, Assad also calls for the destruction of Israel. So the only question is, when the prophet Asaph said that Asher or Assyria is joined with these people, does it include Syria? Well, the oldest map that you could, well, I can find of the Assyrian Empire goes back to 824 BC, and it was this dark green shape here. And you notice it, it went all the way over and covered a good chunk of Iraq, which is round here, but it came all the way round, and there's Damascus, look. So this is South Syria. So if we put Syria on the map and superimposed it, Syria covers this area here. So categorically, I think we can be certain that the, when Asaph talked about um, Assyria, that it absolutely included modern day Syria. And, and of course, it was a wider territory. So it might even be code to say, look, it, this is an even bigger, uh, uh, you know, you know, there's other nations as well that might join in. And as we know, there's um, many groups in, in modern day Iraq that might actually uh, come into play here because Iran has got proxy armies in Iraq and Syria and northern Israel. And of course, as we know, in southern Israel, I'm just going to play you a little video clip to stop me talking for a second. This is a little video clip about Hezbollah, who are, of course, north of Israel. Have a look at this. And Hamas continue their fighting on other fronts. But the ultimate question that has been on everyone's mind ever since Hamas first launched their attack on October 7th is what will Iran's queen on the board end up doing? Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, immediately across the border from Israel's north. You see, Hezbollah is revolutionary Iran's greatest ever success story. It was painstakingly created by the Ayatollah Khamenei and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps during the 1980s out of Lebanon's own significant Shia Muslim population centers in the south and the east of the country, representing the first other country that Iran successfully exported their Shiite Islamic revolution into. Ever since, Hezbollah has been dedicated to driving out all American and European influence in Lebanon, defending Lebanon's Shia Muslim community, spreading Iran's Islamic revolution elsewhere in the world, and assisting Iran with destroying the state of Israel from existence. Since its founding, Hezbollah has grown into what is almost certainly the most influential and well-armed non-state actor anywhere in the world today, and is probably more influential and well-armed than many actual countries are. 
Their leader, Hassan Nasrallah, boasted in 2021 that the organization had 100,000 fighters at their disposal, while Western estimates believe they have at least 60,000 which is still roughly as large as the entire standing army of Lebanon itself. So there we go. It's a huge force that's there, and they're fighting Israel every single day, but in a low-key way at the moment. So what's what's the outcome of all of this? Well, the outcome is, according to Psalm 83, that these nearby surrounding enemies of Israel are going to come to an end. And it says in verse 9 of Psalm 83, do unto them as you did to Midian, do unto them as you did to Sisera and to Jabin and to Oreb and Zeb and Zeba and Zalmana, all mentioned, of course, uh, there, all of them mentioned in Judges chapter uh, 4 to 6. And every last one of them who were Israel's enemies back at the time of the Judges came to horrific ends. And the first one on the list there, Sisera, had his head nailed to the ground with a ten peg by somebody called Jail. And once she'd hammered his head into the ground with a ten peg, she then proceeded to cut his head off. So this is, you know, a very, very, very unpleasant death. But she made certain that this man was dead. And that's what's going to happen, according to God, to the enemies surrounding Israel. Which is why, you know, this sort of headline, Israel hammers Hamas targets in Gaza. It's almost like the same language from Psalm 83, the hammering of the nail into the head of Sisera, and Israel is hammering um, Hamas. In fact, if you look at the actual song of Jael in Judges chapter 5, uh, it says, Her hand reached for the tent peg, her right hand for the worker's hammer, she struck Sisera, she crushed his head, she shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, there he lay. At her feet he sank, he fell, where he sank, there he fell, dead. That's, the, that's what it says. This is what God says is the fate of these people who want to destroy uh, Israel. Um. We know from Zechariah 12, it's the same story of uh, people that surround, look, surrounding peoples are going to go berserk, basically, because of Jerusalem. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. It's their drunken, basically. They're reeling, they're intoxicated, and it's because of Jerusalem, but it says that the clans of Judah, that's the leaders of Judah, uh, would be like a fire pot in a wood pile, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. They're going to consume all the surrounding peoples, right and left, but Jerusalem is going to remain intact and in her place, unlike Zechariah 14. So this is the same as Psalm 83. Now you might say to me, well, Andy, is this really anything to do with Jerusalem? Is, in, is, is, is it just hatred for Israel? But is Jerusalem on their agenda? Well, the clue's in the title of what they've done. Because when Hamas launched their attack on October the 7th, uh, the last day, by the way, of the Feast of the Tabernacles, which is significant, uh, they called it Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. And Al-Aqsa is reference to this site here. So there's the Dome of the Rock. There is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But as the BBC site says down the bottom, if you can just about read it, Palestinians call the whole of this site, not only the mosque, the whole of the Temple Mount site, they call it the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's what they call the whole site, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, not just this little building here. So they're referring to Temple Mount as a whole, which is the beating heart of Jerusalem. It's where the original temple was, of course, and it's where the Dome of the Rock is right now. So this, they're saying in, not code, they're saying this is a Jerusalem war. That's what this war is about. They're, they're not going to use the word Jerusalem because Jerusalem is, is obviously there. Uh, uh, you know, it's the 
the word that the Jews would use for it. So that's why they talk about it as the Al-Aqsa uh, conflict. The other thing that's uh, happened, and this has been on the news a lot, is around this situation with Yemen. So Yemen has caused a real problem towards the back end of last year and certainly into this year. So let's just have a quick think about what on earth is happening with a country perhaps we've not, not really thought much about before, because there's this country down the bottom here, underneath Saudi Arabia, there's Israel, there's Iran over here. I mean, what is happening with Yemen? What are they up to and how have they got involved in this? And what does the Bible say? So um, on December the 12th, it says uh, in Newsweek, Israel's war erupts at sea and it threatens to drag in America. So um, it says there, with Israel expanding its offensive against Palestinian Hamas in the south of Gaza, maritime attacks being conducted hundreds of miles away, by a powerful Yemeni movement aligned with Iran mark a growing escalation with the potential to drag America deeper into the conflict. Uh, December the 18th, fighting in the Red Sea is intensifying as more international warships pile on. So um, uh, Britain and America sent warships into the Red Sea to try and stop the Houthis who are these uh, terrorist uh, group funded by Iran in Yemen who started shooting at merchant ships traveling through uh, the Red Sea. And they basically said, we're going to keep doing this until Israel backs out of um, Gaza. The trouble is the Red Sea carries a sixth of the entire world shipping trade. A sixth of the entire world goes through the Red Sea. And at the minute, almost all of it is being diverted around the south of Africa to get round into Europe. So it's a real, real problem. In fact, uh, our, you know, the prime minister of the UK said last week that this event alone has taken 0.3 percent of uh, UK GDP and has also um impacted inflation and inflation is going up purely because some terrorists in the Red Sea are firing missiles and rockets at ships and causing them to to have to go on a gigantic expensive detour. So then what happened was in January, the UK and allies issued a final warning to the Houthis over the Red Sea attacks and said, if you keep doing it, we're going to bomb you. They did keep uh, firing missiles. So on the 12th of January, Britain and America launched airstrikes against the Houthi uh, targets. That hasn't made a blind bit of difference, really, because they've continued to fire 14 Houthi missiles aimed at ships in the Red Sea. That's just a, a, a few days ago. Now, you might say, where does this fit in? Where does this little area down the bottom of Saudi Arabia fit in? Um, could we have seen anything like this? Well, here's something interesting. So in Joel chapter three, um, which I think is again talking about the inner ring war. It's a, a, so this this part of Joel three is taught. This, these few verses, are, I think, are, are linked to Psalm 83. I think they're linked to Zechariah chapter 12. God says, and I think almost in a sarcastic manner, what have you got to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, uh, which are the bases for Hezbollah, and all the coasts of Palestine, the Gaza Strip? What have you got to do, do with me, Hezbollah and uh, Hamas? Basically, God is saying there. Will you render me a rec recompense? If you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you've taken my silver and my gold, you've carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things. You know, they've carried God's people as hostages, haven't they, into Gaza. Um, but look what it says down there in verse eight. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off. For the Lord has spoken it. So God says, I've got a problem with you, Tyre and Zidon and the coast of Palestine, Hezbollah, Hamas. 
you've done something terrible to me and I'm going to recompense you right back. And what's going to happen is your own sons and daughters are going to be sold to the Sabaeans. Now, I ask you, where is this area of Sabaeans? It's an interesting question. So if you go and look at just when you get a minute, type Sabaeans into Wikipedia. And if you do that, this is what comes up. It says the Sabaeans, they founded the kingdom of Saba in modern day Yemen. Well, well, well. So God says the people appear that are fighting against you, Israel, and have taken you off captive. Uh, what have you got to do with me? I tell you what's going to happen to you. You're going to be sent down to where the Sabaeans live, down here into Yemen. Isn't that incredible? And these two, so basically, if you put it um, on, on a map, what you've basically got here is the is the king of, of Iran here with all his pawns here. So he's got pawns of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. He's got the, he's got his, um, he's got his queen here with, with Hezbollah. He's got knights and bishops. This is like a chessboard thing. You know, he's got uh, he's got Syria. He's got uh, he's got uh, Iran's got uh, knights in Iraq, but he's also got his rook down here. The Houthis down there in in Yemen, and there in Joel chapter three, absolutely astounding. This is that God mentions these this group here because these are all based in the coast of Palestine. This group here is Bullah that are Tyre and Zidon, and says they're all going to end up down here. And all three are connected and are on our news pretty much every night at the minute. That, to me, pretty amazing. Um, we also know that Syria is going to get involved. We're not going to cover much of this right now. I'm pretty certain you'll know that Israel is very frequently striking Syria. Russia's getting increasingly agitated and annoyed uh, with that uh, but Syria, uh, Israel continues to bomb areas of Damascus Iran and Hezbollah bases both attacked uh, near Damascus recently um, the IDF warns that the next major attack will come from Jordan and Syria we you know we're being told here exactly what's going to happen and if you want to read all about it before it actually happens Go and read all about it in Isaiah 17. Isaiah 17 tells us of a cataclysmic, maybe even nuclear uh, response that Israel finally makes when this war has escalated to, and this probably now we're in the time of, of the push and the time of trouble such as never was. Damascus is going to be completely destroyed and removed from being a city. You can still go and visit Damascus today if you wanted to. I wouldn't advise it, but you could. It's still there as a city. God says it's going to be removed from being a city. It's still going to happen. Um, and it's and it's building up. And I think even today, Israel has killed some senior Iranian people in Syria. I haven't got the latest on that right now, but it, it, there's something been uh, going on there. So all of that's been happening and after the initial inner ring war, there's a temporary time of peace for Israel where their immediate enemies have been dealt with. But into this sort of um, pseudo peace, it's not a true peace, uh, true peace comes when Jesus returns, into this temporary void of peace come the outer circle of nations of Ezekiel 38, none of which, of course, border Israel, and all of them come rushing in like a, a you know a great tidal wave. In fact, it's described exactly like that in Isaiah 17, because the end of Isaiah 17, the start of it starts with Damascus being destroyed. The next bit says Israel's going to be weakened but survives, and the end of the chapter says, "Oh, look, listen." The armies of many nations roar like the roaring of the sea. Hear the thunder of the mighty forces as they rush forward like the thundering waves. That is what is coming down the track. This is the outer circle war coming in like a tsunami. 
In fact, of course, um, Ezekiel uh, 38, let me just animate a few bits here. Look, we'll go back slightly. Ezekiel 38 talks about it. It says in Ezekiel 38, a long time from now, you talking to Gog, but this outer circle of nations will be called into action in the distant future. You will swoop down upon the land of Israel. Now look at this, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war. So which war is Israel recovering from when the outer circle nations come in? I put it to you, it's a specific war, and it's the war that's led to them dwelling confidently and without walls, bars and gates. It's the inner ring war. That's what I think. And at the moment, there is walls, and they have got these terrifying enemies around them, but we're told... When Go comes down, the land will be unwalled villages. They're gonna he's gonna attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people living without walls and without gates and bars. We're not, excuse me, in that situation at the minute. We know if Putin's still on the throne, and there's every chance he will be, because of course in 2023, uh, he he said he's gonna run for office in the elections coming up shortly. He will win because uh, he can't lose, because he's either shot his uh, his opponents or he's locked them up. So Putin will just win with 90 plus percent of the vote. And he can reign for another six years from, to, from this year onwards, which takes you up to 2030. Every likelihood this man is the man that God is talking about in Ezekiel 38 as the ruler Gog of Russia. And it says in verse 10 that you will think, he says, this is God talking about the mind of Putin. You will think an evil thought and you will say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages to take a spoil and to take a prey. Well, this is amazing, really, because Israel, for the first time, has got something that Putin is interested in, and that is oil and gas just have a now i'm going to play a little video it lasts two minutes bear with me because to me this is mind-blowing right when you listen to this and think of it from putin's perspective of wanting a spoil from israel But Israel's energy security problem finally started turning around in the late 2000s, when a series of big natural gas discoveries started suddenly being made in the eastern Mediterranean, right off of their own shoreline. In 2009 and 2010, a small American energy company based out of Houston called Noble discovered the massive Tamar and Leviathan gas fields within Israel's economic waters. Several smaller gas fields would be discovered in the years that have followed to the point where it is now believed that Israel possesses nearly 1,100 cubic kilometers worth of natural gas reserves. Meaning that in only the span of a decade and a half, the country went from being completely insignificant in the global gas industry to having one of the top 25 largest reserves of gas in the world. Offshore drilling platforms were constructed, and by 2019, Israel was producing from both the Tamar and the Leviathan natural gas fields. And for the very first time, Israel was actually producing more natural gas than they were consuming. By the start of this decade in the 2020s, that fact enabled Israel to start doing two things that it had never been capable of doing before. First, it enabled the Israelis to become significantly more energy independent and less reliant on imports coming in from abroad. Israel's own natural gas supplies currently power more than 70% of the country's electricity. While Israel's domestically produced solar energy from solar farms across the southern Negev desert is expected to grow enough in the future to fully encompass the remaining 30% of Israeli's electricity supply by the end of the decade in 2030. Meaning that by that time, Israel will no longer have to rely on imports from anywhere to keep their electricity going. And second, Israel's production of natural gas rapidly beginning to exceed their own demands for it opened the door in the 2020s to Israel becoming a significant natural gas exporter as well. Israel already exports fairly substantial amounts of gas via pipelines to neighboring Egypt and Jordan, and there are further proposals in the works to construct a new 6 billion euros subsea pipeline from Israel to Cyprus to Greece to Italy that will open the door to Israel becoming a major natural gas supplier to the European Union as well. 
will expect to liquefy natural gas processing facilities constructed around Israel's west coast will open up the possibility of Israel exporting its gas to anyone in the world who wants it. Israel's publicly stated ambitions are now to achieve a natural gas export capacity of 25 to 30 cubic kilometers per year by the end of the decade in 2030. An ambition that, if achieved, will skyrocket Israel from zero natural gas exports as recently as 2010 to one of the top 15 natural gas exporters in the ent entire world. That is what Putin, I believe, will be interested in. And of course, give me just two minutes, nearly finished. So basically, you know, the war in Gaza has turned Putin against uh, Israel. In fact, there's a lot of reports that think Putin's hand was even behind all of this anyway, because he wanted a distraction from Ukraine. And bearing in mind how close Iran and Russia are, and how reliant uh, Russia has become on Iran, to, who are supplying them uh, with drones to attack Ukraine, um, a lot of analysts are saying the one of the big winners out of the war in Gaza is Putin, because the, the, the US is now distracted, weapons headed to Ukraine are now headed to Israel, and it's seriously weakening America's own position in the Middle East with, with turmoil going on, which, which they can't control. So there's there's a possibility Putin's own hand, uh, however slight or or behind the scenes it was, was even behind this. And Putin has turned very much against Israel, even comparing Israel to to Nazi Germany. Um, he's been working in 2023, forming a Russian Iranian axis. Um, Putin forming axis of terror as he welcomes Hamas and Iran to Moscow. That was in October the 26th after the attacks. Uh, Russia is turning increasingly hostile towards Israel as it picks sides in the Middle East. These are all headlines. Recent weeks, Russia's Putin meets Iran's racy in Moscow. Uh, Netanyahu demands that Moscow severs ties with Iran. Um, why are ties between Russia and Israel at their lowest point since the fall of the Soviet Union? The wheels truly are coming off at a rapid rate between Russia and Israel right now, all leading up to the point when some point in the future, Russia uh, is going uh, to come down. So there's a lot more that we could say. I did actually find... Uh, this is the last slide that I gave in January uh, last year, because uh, I said, I wonder what might come down the track in 2023. So I went because I gave this as a talk at Malvern meeting in the UK in January at the start of January 20 uh, at the very in January 2023. So exactly a year ago. So I was trying to say with Bible in hand, what might we see in 2023? And this is up on YouTube, so you can go and see when it when it was first posted. And that there's three things that I said that we might see. First of all, I said that the Ukraine war is probably going to reach some sort of stalemated truce because I don't think Putin will be able to take over Ukraine. I don't think the Bible indicates that. I think the Bible indicates he's going to take the area that's covered by ancient Magog, which is southeastern Ukraine. So I think it's going to reach some stalemated truce, and it pretty much has reached a stalemate. It hasn't reached a, a, a signed off truce yet. But again, the, in the last few um, weeks of last year, in 2023, in December, Putin said we should have peace talks. And I think that is Gonna, going to happen at some point, because I don't think Putin will invade Israel while he's also fighting a war in Ukraine. No nation wants to fight two wars. The other thing that I put was the new hardline Israeli government, which had just come into power, of course, in uh, January 2023, may well try to make peace with Saudi Arabia. This, in turn, leads Iran to activate a war against Israel the inner ring war. So that's what I said in January last year. And pretty much all those things of what we saw. And I don't, that isn't because I'm clever. That is because 
with Bible in hand, that's what you could see coming down the track. And that is what's come down the track. And in 2024, I think we're in the world of the inner ring war. And what's going to happen is that's going to keep escalating to suck in the rest of those nations that surround Israel. But Israel ultimately will win that war, although left weak and end up in a state of uh, some sort of peace for a little while. The outer ring then come in. Meanwhile, Jesus is going to uh, return at some point during uh, from now until then, because when Jesus comes onto the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14, when the war is fully underway with Russia, the saints are with Jesus when he arrives in Jerusalem. Judgment has happened by the time Jesus arrives into Jerusalem. Therefore, if judgment's already happened, it means we must have already been taken. Therefore, you know, at some point we're going to see Jesus uh, come back between now and that point. Sorry, I've gone over. Um, forgive me. I've, I've skipped quite a bit out, but hopefully you got a sense of uh, how we've got to where we've got over the last year. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Brother Andy. Uh, we'll take a moment and, and conclude in prayer and then maybe open it up for a few uh, moments of discussion. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you in thanksgiving for the many things you do for us. We thank you for this opportunity to share the news of the world in light of Bible prophecy. We thank you for your invitation of fellowship with you and with Jesus and with each other. We thank you for revealing your plan and your purpose and making it available to us and giving us clear direction in our lives. We thank you for Jesus, uh, presented as the image of the invisible God who demonstrated your character and grace. And we pray for the soon conclusion of the matter, the return of Jesus, and for the peace of Jerusalem. We recognize that you are fully in control of all these events. The outcome is certain. And we thank you for our place in it. All things we ask and approach you through the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.